Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so let's just know your name, where you're calling from, wh where you're from, and what you do. Okay. Um, so my name is Noa Tamabodomo, and I am a filmmaker. Where I'm from is complicated. I'm afro diasporan but the story is that I was born in Accra here. Uh, when I was very young, my family started moving. So we moved, I've lived in Norway, in Hong Kong, a little bit in California when I was a child. Um, I've been based in New York since like college years, and that's where my filmmaking career started. And that's been my base for a while. But right now I'm back in Accra. Um, I had come here for the holidays in terms of like just the holidays, but now because of the global situation, I've been here and it feels good to be here. So I'm kind of in transition with where I'm from or where I'm based. Um, but the short answer is, yeah, I'm a filmmaker originally from here with much more complicated narrative around that. And then in a transition. Okay. okay. So you, you also, um, you also believe in the idea of um, home, home in, in its multiplicities. Uh, so home means so many things to you, not just uh, maybe the country you were born or your father and your mother's country. Yeah, I, I have always, yeah, because of my experience, I've always believed that. Um, and that's just been how I've operated. But I will say that more recently, um, maybe just from like innate need, I've, I've, re it's become something that I concretely need. I've always been okay because that's been my reality to just move and be here and be there and go where the work takes me. And that's still how I, I see myself operating beyond this. But right now, there's like a more pressing physical concrete need for like a home. A place you know okay so for so you I'm kind of exploring that for you where is that exploration taking you into Oof. um in a weird way it's bringing me back to Ghana mm. right like because I think that part of diaspora is no matter you know I, it's always complicated but I think that when you're in another country and you're being regarded as a foreigner you always think about your home your original home and that always comes up so I think that there's a way in which there's a Ghana. I'm not one of these people who's diaspora and has, doesn't have a deep connection to my family in Ghana. We come here often and like, I did live here when I was a child. And so I do feel like I have a more concrete understanding of Ghana. However, when you're traveling and in diaspora and things are happening and you are aching for home, <laughs> this is the place that comes up for me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here to try and like, I'm, I don't want to give it a mission statement, but in a way I'm here to try and See, you know meet the reality and see what it actually is <laughs> so know, uh, so you had an interesting post right that spoke a lot to um, my experience you know just growing up and to to date and the post says everywhere I am they say I they say I belong elsewhere and that's fine with me and in fact I prefer to be erased so that I may fit cleanly bracket mm. and to the toxic fellowship and gender daring so you you know yeah. the points i'm talking about yeah, yeah. Um, um yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i don't know if you if you want to touch on that um when did you first realize um the questioning of your belonging Um, my answer would be from jump, from the very beginning. Um, I was very young. I was like one and a half when my family emigrated to Norway. So, I mean, if I really want to think about the exact first moments, um, the two things that come to mind is like the class photos from that time. You know, you're in kindergarten, class photos, why, 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 why? It's, it's Norway, so blonde, white, blonde, white, blonde, white, and then a face. But then also I remember when I was four, my family was coming back to Ghana that summer. And I remember talking to my friends, like, I'm going to Ghana and I'm going to Ghana for the summer. And they asked me, oh, are you going to go live in huts? Or are you, are you going to go live in trees like a monkey? And I think that that's something that, you know, 
so many of us have experienced. It's kind of like cliche at this point, but in my memory, that's the only, the first time I would have maybe clocked that I was different in this sort of like home way. But when I was making that post, it was actually because I was confronting this thing of coming back home to Accra and still, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Gaba. So it's like, I speak my language, but I'm not like, you know what I mean? I can't, <laughs> I'm not like a hundred percent fluent. And so me who I'm like, Oh, I speak this language I'm speaking. And everybody's like laughing as I speak. And there's always these like moments that happen when you're being pointed out, it's not from here, you know, especially when you're doing administrative things, it's like, you're always being pointed out. And yet when I'm in America, this is the place I think about when they're doing that to me there, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so just parsing through that, that there is no, I really see, I mean, it's maybe cliche, but I do really feel like because of the worldview I was given from growing up on four continents, I am an alien. Like my worldview is so expansive of this earth that I am an alien. But what I say with that is that I heavily respect Accra as the first place I landed on yeah, this earth. It's, yeah, it's interesting how um, we can have different experiences but very similar, you know, in, in, in um, the way people perceive what they don't understand and how they respond to it, you know, because I was born in Nigeria, I grew up in Nigeria till um, I was an adult, you know, um, but I experienced all of this within Nigeria, you know, in Benin, mm -hmm. where I was born and raised, um, have people yeah. tell me, I do not sound like I'm from there, or I do not share the same ideas, so I can't be from there, you know? So, you, and, and you keep moving, and people just keep questioning. Even coming to Ghana, yeah. and people making me uh, understand that, no, you're Nigerian, you know? And, and <laughs> all, of this, all of these nuances, uh, I, I feel are important because it made me, appreciate my body you know it made me understand the information that i carry you know mm -hmm. within myself so and this is this is how i operate now my body is my home you know because then it, it gives me that ease when i enter into a space i do not need um any form of validation from anybody to feel yeah. at ease, you know? So, um, I hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So just I like to hear that. I like to hear that. Yeah. I was saying I like to hear it because I really, it's something I aspire to. And I know I'll get there because I always know that the truth is that there is, even for people, as you just said, who grew up in one place and that, you know, you're always going to feel a certain otherness. And that's just a part of the human experience. And I think yeah. anyone that's saying, I have a place and a home and it's concrete is lying in a way, you know? Yeah. So I, I admire that you're already there and I'm working on it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's constant. Even, even me saying this is where I am right now, it's still a struggle, you know, because I feel like whatever, whatever we carry, whatever um, perspective, whatever lived um, experience, Whatever, whatever we think we are, we have to wake up daily, you know, and accept that. So yeah. definitely there are days when I wake up and I do not feel like that, you know? Mm. Uh, maybe because of an experience or maybe just being tired to, to carry the burden that that, that comes with. Because um, the, more, the more I feel personally like, the more you, you find out more about yourself, the more responsible you are to guard those, those findings, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So just looking back and what I did, because this is the first time we're talking, what I did is I just opened your Instagram. Um, I didn't want to go into any press or your movie or anything because I just, wanted this to be more grounded in, in very, very personal. So I'm looking at a photo of you, your mom, from <laughs> 2000 and, I think 2001, 
Yes. Uh, and and like a you have guy? siblings, whether cousins, I don't know. But it's a very beautiful photo, you know, because you're all smiling. And can you, can you recall, can you explain what was happening there besides the photo? Um, explain what was happening in the photo or why I posted? Uh, for you, what was happening with you? Because definitely uh, coming of age, I think this is Ghana, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so, oh well, the photo, my family lives in Austria right now. So that photo was when I went home for Christmas in Aust uh, to Austria. And, you know, we were having one of those Christmas nights. I was making the cocktails. We took a picture. <laughs> so that's what the photo is. But I think it was a Mother's Day post, if I remember correctly. And I think, yeah, I was just um, reflecting on my relationship with my mother. And I think on one hand, I was reflecting on like the immense strength because at the time I was born, it was like the Rollins years, like PNDC years, and I had to be a cesarean. I was born in Polibu, but like, it was a whole day. Like it was one of those like giving birth in Ghana in the eighties kind of yeah. stories where it was like, the fact that we all made it was such a miracle. Um, yeah. So I was just reflecting on that strength. And then I think I, in that post, if I remember correctly, I was also reflecting on when, when we lived here in this house that I'm in right now in 97. And, um, you know, people came, like armed robbers, came, or I don't know if they're armed, but robbers came and took everything. And we had this, you know, it was like, uh, because we lived in Norway at the time, we would bring stuff over in a container. And so we had this TV, a gigantic TV that was completely for show because, it, it just never worked. I don't know if in the passage it, it had broken or something, but it never worked. And they carried that thing out. So it's like, we're all sitting here like this, like, oh no, we've lost everything. And she immediately is like, well, at least they helped us get rid of this TV, you know, like making everybody laugh, you know? <laughs> it's like this thing that we've been meaning to do. Um, so just reflecting on that, but then also trying to reflect on like, I think mother-daughter relationships are immensely complicated and I'm somebody who deeply loves my mom and she's like an amazing mother, but it's all, there's also a lot to, I think that sort of like attunement, like, I don't know, I don't know if it's mother-daughter or just mother-child, just like feeling so close to every like up and down that she's had and maybe trying to reflect on like where as I grow, I've had to learn to not completely be enmeshed in that way yeah. and to know when to like, be attached and to know yeah just to have my own personhood and yeah. respect and love my mother versus being completely <laughs> wrapped up yeah yeah so looking like looking into that can you remember um the earliest memory of your mother that you have Woo. um that was a hard one i'm trying to think like what would be the earliest yeah. earliest yeah. A weird one is I, you know, we lived in this uh, like student housing when we lived in North. My, my, my parents went to students and um, we were going upstairs to my friend Stina's house and we were playing hide and seek and um, I had put my hand in the door at hiding and she slammed the door and so like all my fingers came off on one nail. And I remember them carrying me down the stairs like this. I was like maybe three at this point. Um, and I just remember the moment they're carrying me down the stairs and I'm like not even that conscious and my mom comes up this is coming up the stairs and she's pregnant with my sister wow. and she's just like making her way up and she just sees what's happening <laughs> and just like that shock that realization that like I don't know there's something about that look that I do yeah. remember but I don't want to like my first what I'm calling my first memory to be such no, a no, no, no. I, I, like it, <laughs> because for me when it's interesting when I ask people this um it, some people go to their strongest, the strongest memory they recall, mm. because it's always going to end up being that. It's always going to end up being this, the, the, the earliest, strongest memory you recall, you know? But I feel like yeah. Yeah. It, as people, we should, you know, take time in our in our day to day and just try to see things we can recall from our past. And and it's, it's, it's an exercise that I wish people do more uh, because sometimes you see that the stories you tell yourself might be different, you know? It's true. Yeah. It's true. So, so now, now looking at that, um, can, you, can you talk 
if you if you wish to can you talk into um your your relationship with your grandmothers uh mm -hmm. patana matana and how you feel they have they have influenced um, the person you are today directly or indirectly yeah that's a very complicated one it's interesting you you brought that up because part of what i'm really exploring now is grandmother and grandfather and what that meant and like lineage and all these things um in like a deep way because i think my my narrative around grandparents is always yeah. like a sense of loss of not getting to grow up around them right so it's like it's double because my paternal grandfather and mother live in our village in the upper west region so that was like we would come to Accra for the holidays but then it'd be another trip not always you know then also so I've, I've reflect i've been reflecting on like if i add up all the days i ever got to spend with let's say my paternal grandmother yeah. it's too little for what i would have maybe wanted you know yeah. um and then and then with my maternal grandmother like the, you know my mom grew up in kamasi but she my maternal grandmother when we lived here in the 90s was here taking care of us and also because my parents were students when i was born i was sent to live with my maternal grandmother as a baby baby, baby. so like maybe even my first like more, most consistent caretaker was her um and it, it's something I'm trying to explore. I, I really enjoy being home and like getting to like sit with aunts and uncles and just like hear stories and hear stories and hear stories. Um, so I'm really like in that process right now. Uh, but if I, you know, what I, what I have been like, for my maternal grandmother, she was definitely somebody who just took care of people like deeply. Like it was just like, um, I don't want I don't know how to say it. So it's not just like a general, it was just like, you could rely on her to take care of people and people did, you know? Um, and she just had that instinct. She was always busy in the house doing something. Um, and my relationship to her now, even though it might sound strange, is this, so I'm sitting in this, in the back of the house. This is where I usually write and do work. And to my right, there's like a, a, a palm tree that I've just, <laughs> I speak whatever it sounds, really been connecting with. Yeah, and then coming to find I, out recently, my, my, yeah, exactly. My maternal grandmother planted that. Oh. And I think that, you know, so I don't know. There's just something that's... Yeah. That's like a yeah how I'm connecting to that right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was my paternal grandmother. I think um, so. She was my last living grand. All my grandparents are dead, but she was my last living oh. grandparent. She passed in 2017, and she passed in April. So so I was here when the second anniversary came, and it was sort of like my family was gonna just like maybe mention it and move on. I, but I had it in me. I don't know that, that we had to like, I, we went about like Coke and this like Hollandia, like yogurt drink and sat here and everybody told the story uh, about her. Um, you know, my cousin, one of my cousins like really told one of the like nursery rhymes or like folk tales that she used to say, like word for word. So I got to hear that. And just even hearing her about her from the point of view of people who spent more time with her and also getting to share my very short timings, which is mostly that, um, when I was when I last spent time with her here in 2015, um, to watch TV together, um, and she, you know, I'm a filmmaker, so she would turn to me one day and she was like, "This is the work that you do," and I'm like, "Yeah," and she was like, and then uh, she was so like, "So, so she 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 understood." <laughs> yes, and and that kind of validation I have to say is like rare with what I do. So yeah. I just, it was just, that one, like for Moya, like, it was just like, whoa. Yeah. like it meant a lot. And then, um, but the other question was, what she turned once and she was like, so in this TV, are these spirits in the TV? <laughs> wow. And I mean, the answer is yes. Wow. Yeah, because, <laughs> yeah. because through film, you capture, you capture spirit forever. I, I could yeah. as long as the film is preserved. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So yeah. A lot of nice moments, but I'm really trying to fill the gaps a lot right now. So yeah, yeah. it's 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 really nice just seeing um, how all of this weave into the experience. Now, peop it it's people might look at you and be like, "Wow, what what an inspiring um, career as a filmmaker," you know. Um, because it's, it's, it's one, not easy to step out and make film or whatever project you want to make. And it's another thing for people to like what you create. 
right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. it, it, there are a lot of people who feel like they've not created to the level of admiration, like, whatever you want to sit, put it. And you have a work that people like. But then, um, in, in, in a post just a week ago, um, you were speaking about imposter syndrome, right? The, the, so it's kind it's, I, when I saw that, I really felt um, like good because it's good to see people who are quote unquote, you know, having a growing career, you know, also speak about the things that people might not see. Yeah. So that you know that it's never an easy journey. So you know this post I'm talking about. It, it's a nice photo. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's really nice. And if, if you can just touch on it a little and tell me where you are right now and, yeah. and what experience you were going through at that moment. Yeah. Um, that I would be named a kind of quote unquote successful filmmaker of some sort is like, it's very, I have a complicated relationship to the ways in which my work has been vetted. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I don't want it. I just mean that um, there's a number of metrics of how people measure whether you're being successful. And I'm successful in one way, but at the same time, in, the, in a version of the film world that I'm in, I haven't made a feature film. Yeah. And so I know why I haven't, and I know the things I'm not compromising on and the things I, I'm wanting to build in order to make this film. And so I know that in the long run, even if it's a decade from when I started, if I stand at that premiere, I'm gonna be really proud and know it took that time. That's something I know inside myself, but because within the wider industry, it's, there's no feature, you know, you do get to these moments when you're wondering, it's like, <laughs> is it working? Am I moving forward? These questions do come up, especially because when you're like, and I, I'll use the phrase like when you're like pregnant with an idea for this long, you do get to a point where you're like, if this film never gets released, which God forbid, but if it never got released, I would literally be a crazy person because it's like I obsessed. And it's like when you're, yeah, when you're creating, I can't name the hours I've spent on this yeah. because even if I clocked in and clocked out, I'm thinking about it, you know, so for years. And so there's this idea that, or idea that I sometimes get where I'm like, if I have not uh, created, if I never create this film, I'm just a crazy person yeah. <laughs> who had an idea yeah. for literally years and years. And, years. Yeah. and so like these, these thoughts do come up, but I do think uh, most of the time I have perspective on it and I know that I'm building, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, you made a film. I just had a script and I made a film. Like the level to which the things I want to stay true to mean to build. That's why in, in that post I did use the phrase cultivation work. It was very um, specific. Like, it's like you're building a literal, you're tilling the soil, you're working on it, you know? And that feels like what I'm doing for so many years to then like finally go and make this thing. Um, but when you're in that process, it's like, you can, easily, you can easily forget that you have been doing work and you have been moving forward and you have been working on this because you can forget that progress is not linear, but also people will, constantly try and show you and try and demean you because you haven't done this thing you know there's a lot of things i've been up for that i think i think i was like really perfect for but has she made a feature though you know and it's like it becomes this weird um barrier i understand it but it is a weird barrier because you know some of those features i'm watching not to you know i respect anyone who's made a feature to be honest like <laughs> so but you know some of the features we watch if we're being honest are not great and yet it's a feature, so, yeah. you know, next stage. Um, anyway. <laughs> so do you, do you think because of the success of your short, do you think now that the pressure is just too much or mm. are you putting that pressure on yourself? Okay. The pressure has, was real for a long time. I think that um, the pressure is real, but also like, I think that, there's a big disconnect between what I actually want to do with film and where I've been position like, accolades that come from. Yeah, exactly. Position. Because it's like, those things matter. I don't want to demean them. I'm thankful for them. And they, they do matter because they do give you opportunities, you yeah. know? Yeah. 
yeah. even the things I want to do that might be separate from them, those people are looking at me because this is, this is on my, you know, in my career or in my bio. Um, but at the same time, from when I started to want to make movies, it wasn't to go to Sundance and play here and do this, right? It wasn't to make a feature. There's like much deeper questions that I feel like I haven't been able to be true to. And that feels much more pressuring than the lights, right? There's also like, and I don't want to sound too, it's such an, um, a who you know world and an in club and that's sort of like a certain type of history making Yeah. that I just feel like, I don't want it to sound like I'm saying it'll definitely happen, but the hardest part with those worlds is getting into them. Yes. You know? So I'm, I'm not worried about where my film will premiere as much as I'm worried about staying true to why I even started doing this. And that's where the real pressure comes from. And, and you are not the first person to go through this. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the forever battle that we all battle in different industries, different fields. It, once, you, once you identify that, no, I want to do something different. You know, and yeah. once you identify that, that that thing that you want to do that is different is completely different from, from what is popular or what is accepted, you know, or maybe you want to do something disruptive. It's, it's automatic. It's, it's an automatic burden. And, and then yeah. the extra burden is if you start within your journey and before you get to where you want to go, you get a certain type of attention or light on on your journey to where you're heading, you know, because yeah. then that becomes a distraction in itself. So, um, but but I want to say, just the fact that you know, you are where, it's a it's a beautiful place to be, you know, because every time you walk into those rooms or. Um, those award ceremonies, those screenings, those festivals that you know that I'm here, but this is not where I want to be. It's, yeah. it's a beautiful place to be because it means that you are not distracted. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hear that and I really appreciate you saying that. I think I had to learn it the hard way though. I didn't, I didn't rock up knowing this. I think that actually, you know, when I first started film school, I remember having debates with my my classmates because I was I was like I'm not thinking about can can is not going to be the marker of like whether my movie is good and I used to debate them on this but then I was very young I was like 24 when my movie went to Sundance and so I do think that I did get sucked into like thinking these people were my people and also like that whole indie American film world but also thinking that I was entitled to certain things because you know I mean you're in film school you're like in a film industry where you see people who you're like literally getting the same things as it's like going into those meetings and they're working and then you're going into those meetings and you're saying, I want to make a movie in Zambia with non-actors, <laughs> you know, and nobody has an into that. So you're walking out of these meetings and nothing's coming from them. And I think that there's, um, I did, I have had my time of being sucked into thinking that was my world and that was the world. Um, and that didn't end well for me really. So yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to say like, I learned it the hard way, but I do know now I'm not distracted. I'm like, like I know what the purpose of those spaces, yeah. um, and I enjoy those spaces, yeah. but I'm very aware that it's not the crux of what I want to do. Just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, come out of this, but I just want you to know that every time you find your, yourself in those spaces, being different, being of a different, different mindset is, is, um, it's, it's actually the way of breaking the barriers, the doors, changing the narrative. Because it also means that even though you don't work out with the projects you want, it means that you've made it possible for the next person with a different idea to walk in, you know? And, and this is the work of, of creatives before you who have done the same work, you know? Some of the people yeah. who, broke the, who broke down the biggest doors do not have big projects to show for it, you know? But yeah. then when you, when you are someone who pays attention, you see the fruits of those labors, right? So it's, it's yeah. really amazing that, um, not just that you're, you're, doing, you're moving in this way, you're very conscious of it. And I look forward to seeing 
whatever project you put out next. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about, <laughs> so you, you posted a picture, right? And you said, um, remembering how I used to widen my eyes like that for photographs, because I thought otherwise no one would see me. Uh huh. The, 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 the concept. Yeah. And also something that I noticed is that you love your younger self. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. You have a beautiful relationship with your younger self. You, you, yeah, you, you really pay attention to the, the, where you're coming from. It's, it's a, it's a, do you, are you aware of this that maybe you do it unconsciously? <laughs> but, but never had it. Um, it's something that I picked up, and it, I just had to tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that. I've never had it said to me. Like when you said it, it was like woof. But um, it's something I've worked on, <laughs> and and I'm happy that that comes through. Yeah, it's yeah. so looking at this picture, and at what point did you realize that you didn't have to open your eyes? <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I think I was getting that first roll back and realizing that, oh, this, this looks crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. I think, I think it started because I, a photo may, might have been taken when my eyes were closed and I was like completely within the background. You didn't even know I was in the photograph. Yeah. Um, and you know, that was when we were in Norway and I was like, uh, I think at that point, like seven or eight. Um, and definitely going through the deepest versions of like being different and like, you know, coming into your body as a child and you know, that which was kind of horrific for me based on where I grew up. Um, and so like the whole skin visibility as my friend Rahel likes to call it, uh, is, um, was like huge for me then. And I think part of, you know, it, it was almost like when that photo came out and it was like, I had receded into the background and my eyes weren't open. I didn't see that as like just a thing that happened. It was like, something I had to fight, you know? Like I, the darkness, I was something, I don't know, of my skin or something was something I had to like actively fix. And so I guess in my eight year old brain, I came up with the like, when they're taking the photo, you're like, okay, let's make sure we're not blinking, not knowing. I think when I saw it, from my memory, when I saw the results, it's when I immediately knew, okay, no, that's not it. Can, um, you, can yeah. you trace the moment you fell in love with film? Woo. Um, I think it came in stages, but I wasn't really into watching movies. I came up, grew up in one of these families, which was more like we read books or I read books as a kid a lot. And um, we didn't, weren't, didn't really, I didn't grow up with like TV or film culture, but I did, my parents did make sure to keep all the like African subject matter films. So we had like Lion King, Serafina, Coming to America. <laughs> like I watched those, <laughs> but um, I remember being on the bus when I was like 14, 15 and saying I didn't like movies. And then my friend Andreas, who was a family friend, just being like, okay, you're just not watching the right movies. And I like dared him to like show me movies. And he showed me like Requiem for a Dream, which is such a horrific film when I look at it now. But I was like, oh, it started to be like, oh, okay, there's like a language here that you can play with to tell yeah. a story. And I think the movie that I walked out of first and was like, oh, okay. Like you could really do this was seeing Eternal Sunshine when I was 16. And just eternal sunshine of the spotless mind and just being like whoa like the whole form is being broken to really say something yeah and but i think it was uh when i moved to america for college um and you know the way i talk about books people talk about about like about movies in america like it just grown up with so much film culture that you know film doesn't become this like because in my teen years i was in hong kong and so we only got the like worst like mary kate and ashley Olsen <laughs> movies you know, like not movies that I would really get excited about, but then being in America and people are so conversant and people are like talking about movies, movies, movies. I started to like just watch a lot more. And I went through a summer, I just binge watch. I would like bike to the library, take out eight movies, binge watch before Netflix and then come back. And just, um, But I think for me, it was like the love was really around. Yeah, just like a way to use form to tell a story in like all its parts, because yeah moving around a lot, language, always a terrorizing force for me, you know, like very hard to like say something textually or even spoken and have all the people I've ever known and loved really understand it. And also 
just moving around a lot and being foreign and like not understanding a lot of cultures and having to discover them. I think the cinematic language understands that because it's like you're in a place and there's like you're telling a story with the sound, you're telling a story with the colors, you're telling, you know, it is all the parts. Yeah. And so, yeah, once I kind of like clicked into it, it was just like a deep dive. It just felt right, you know? Yeah. And, and moving now as, as a black person, um, when, when did you get the power to say, okay, I'm actually going to make film? Like, I think by the time I was watching movies, I knew because oh, I didn't, oh, you know, I didn't okay. have this culture of, it, it was just like sort of like, from, oh, like I have school. I'm just like, huh? Like from 16, you, you knew that this was going to be a journey. I didn't know like I was gonna do what I'm doing it. Cause like when I went to university even, I thought I was gonna study biology or something, you know, but um, uh, it was more like I knew that I could use it. I just, it didn't click that I was gonna do it until I was like in college and I took a film class um, my like sophomore year or maybe it was a freshman year. And like, it really, really clicked. Um, but I knew from, from the beginning that I, I wanted to use this tool. Yeah. And then, and because of that, I was always, cause there's like a kind of, I was always like editing the movies in a way or like trying to see what I would have done as I was watching them, just because there's a lot of great movies that I discovered, but a majority of, of like popular movies that you're watching as a black person, as a femme person, you know, as anything other than like a certain kind of white manhood, it's like, you always have to do a little bit of editing, you know? It's like, you like the movie, but these jokes are like horrible if you're like a woman, you know, you like the movie, but you have to edit this out. So it's like, I was always like rewriting the movies as to like what I would have done if I didn't enjoy it, you know? Yeah. I hope that comes across the way I'm trying to get it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always interesting to go back to the moment of uh, maybe Eureka, like, oh, okay, you know, because I feel just just the same way of going back to earlier memories. You know, I feel like we we as people can't take those moments for granted. You know, um, yeah. and and when you go, it's like an out of body experience. You go back to that moment and you begin to see so many factors that created that moment, and and then you might realize that oh. It was not just the book that made me fall in love with writing. You know, it was the book, yes, but there was a bird, you know, and and there was this, there was that, you know, the 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 ambience was great. It, it so all of this lead to um, things in life, you know, they gear us into the right space. And for me, I'm always just curious. That's why. Um, documenting true conversation is something that I'm doing because I feel like when 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 you're having conversations, some sometimes not all the time, but people uh, people get themselves into past times, you know, because you have to take out some answers from from what happened. You know, and and that has like an effect just moving forward. It keeps you thinking. So yeah. the first interest, the first post, right? When I opened your Instagram, the one that just popped out. Um, please don't turn your mutual aid huh. project into nonprofit, right? And then there is a post. It means what you wrote means you've been thinking about this. So the, the tweet from this person wasn't what triggered um, you posting that. It's something that you've lived with. It's something that you want to talk about. And I feel the same way, you know? And when you talk to a lot of people who come here, do this very savior-esque kind of project and say, oh, all oh, this or oh, that, and I'd be like, but you're creating uh, social capital and, and all of this stuff. So 
like speak to that like at what point at what point what how do you even identify um who might be doing doing um a genuine project for instance and who might not yeah um okay in terms of context i think i was thinking what i was thinking a lot about is like coming out of you know being part of a lot of collective projects having been and also currently being part of collective projects just the the beautiful moments where people come together to do something and that's like um there's a lot of great intention there yeah. and as it continues invariably people want to institutionalize it and that's not immediately bad it's just about how you institutionalize it and i think just because of the frameworks that have laid out for us yeah people go to this nonprofit thing and you know just like getting the same kind of granting i don't know i just think that so many of the reasons why a lot of collective groups i've been a part of started is to be outside you know to do something radical to like see meet the problems that we were naming and, and really you know address them yeah. um outside of the system in place and so just a, a genuine just sadness not a blaming sadness just sadness around the fact that like as these things do get successful and successful invariably they just you know feed back into the system um but what this this specific post is just like in you know in this era in this time i just was seeing a lot of social media posts from various levels of like individuals but also like institutions talking about care and caretaking and we must care for each other and mutual aid and like you know, our currency is care and like, just people are talking about it and we're clapping for nurses and all this stuff. And I know there's a lot of sincerity in it, but I do think that I made the post because I was thinking like more than, uh, you know, these, these things do go through, like social justice things go through trends. That's always going to happen. But more than anything, caretaking, going through a trend is quite painful, right? Because it's such a tender, complicated relationship to be a caretaker and to be given care you know um and so just feeling weird about people making it like a thing to shout about and a thing to like you know because all i could see is that there'd be so many people who in their public reputation based form would be i'm a caretaker i'm a caretaker but you could double back and see the people they say they're taking care of and maybe they're being neglected right because it's just i just think the two don't mix to be like making a statement about oh i'm doing care and then care just feels like it's so quiet sometimes you know and it's why we do have to like big up our caretakers so much more and this goes to like motherhood as well like it gets so erased when it's not shouted but sometimes when it's shouted it's really not happening so it's like this weird dynamic that's happening um and then there was a second part to your question that please remind me about um i said how do you know um how do you differentiate genuine care and maybe one with a motive yeah i think care with a motive always has to be announced always has to be like look i'm caring for you i'm caring for you look 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 at me <laughs> it's happening and i think genuine care um it comes in so many forms i think it, it surprises you it's like almost like yeah when you know once i was feeling very depressed and, I, and my friends just got together and like sent me flowers oh, and that's... like yeah i didn't know that was happening and like you know that's very beautiful that's to me it's like when you when you receive genuine care it's surprising because it comes in any form you know it's not necessarily that like it's a contract and i'll get up at this time and do this for you and you'll do this for me it just kind of surprises you and like is the thing that makes you remember that you're not alone because i think part of that post is like because of certain disappointments around care that is making me make this post um i've become very independent i just like was socialized from a childhood to just be incredibly independent and i know how to do things myself and i like taking care of myself and i hate relying on people um but ultimately even though i don't think independence is a bad trait interdependence is like the hardest thing in the world and also the thing that matters the most <laughs> you know and i think care makes you remember that you're interdependent yeah yeah i i feel like um I, I, we are here to care for 
um, as much as we can, you know. And it's 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 a very tricky uh, experience because you never can truly tell, you know, what what is genuine care. This is just my perspective, or or um, a care with obviously. The, ref the, the references you just made, I feel like, yeah, you can use those benchmarks to see, but then we might be wrong, we might be right. You know, it's it just case, case by case. And I just feel like we as people need to be more intuitive um, so that, yeah, so that when receiving things, you can identify, you know, sometimes what to accept and what, what not to accept in in the yeah. in in the care giving and care caring um, area yeah. of our lives. Intuitive. That's the word I think that is actually the difference. Like when you like, because I think something that that can be frustrating is when people offer care that they think is what everybody wants as care. Yeah. And one example I'll give is that you know I've worked with many different kinds of producers, but there and you know this is not to say they were they were are very good producers, but there's this moment that I come up with sometimes where it's like we're on the road and we have to get rooms and there's not enough rooms and a producer will immediately be like, you're the director, we're putting you in the biggest room, you get your own room and we're gonna stop it. And they're doing that because they see that as care, right? In a way, they're taking care of the director. But to me, true care, ultimately in a situation like this is to know that me as a person, that's gonna stress me out. That I'm the director and I'm being put in the in the suite while everybody's sharing. I'm I'm the kind of person who would rather just share the room with everyone and be you know and not have this hierarchy. Um, so I was getting frustrated that I was being put in a suite and she didn't understand you know like it, it's strange and I understand I really understand her perspective in this you know because yeah. it's almost like we're caring about you we're sacrificing for you we want you to be in the big room and I think that's kind of where a lot of miscommunication can happen with care because for me being attuned to who i am is to yeah. understand that i'm not yeah. like that <laughs> yeah it, it's, it's what happens when people just blindly want to help or want to care without asking yeah. the, the receiver how would you prefer to be cared for yes exactly yeah and exactly. I, I think this would this this would be a beautiful place to round up but normally there's there's a new uh, something I do now, which is um, I ask my guests if you have questions you also want to ask me. Feel yeah. free. Um, as we were talking, I I didn't know if it was the kind of thing where I could <laughs> double back, but I did. Um, I I'm really curious to hear about you were talking about being from Nigeria um originally and then and yet still having these experiences so i'm so curious to hear about kind of being nigerian in ghana yeah um, okay. and then after that i also want to hear about your relationship to your paternal and maternal grandmother yeah okay so my relationship with my maternal grandmother is it's a very um complicated very sweet um spiritually energized one um so i lost my mother in 2001 and that's a last that's the only child that um she had two kids and they're both not phys physically present with her um so she is this older woman without children to care for her right mm. because all she has is grandkids and and i have uh, for a long time kept my relationship with her you know and it's that's why i said it's bittersweet because i am a strong um copy of my mother so mm. when i'm with her it's it's like an instant reminder of the child that is no longer here um so it's always it's always it's always a bittersweet uh, experience but i've been also documenting her for a while um and just just documenting no 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 end goal i just felt like um there were moments where i'll go there i feel she was fragile 
you know. I said, okay, let me just document. I don't know what might happen. Then she has stayed long, way past the, the beginning stages of me documenting her. And, mm. and now I'm coming to this space where I feel kind of not in a rush. I feel kind of comfortable and satisfied with the connection that we have, with the love that we have. So I don't need to always run to Nigeria to go um, see her to feel connected. Um, so, and that's, the, that's where the spiritual bond is becoming stronger. I, yeah. I carry her now with me, just like as I carry my mother, you know? So mm-hmm. it's a very beautiful, very beautiful relationship. I, I think I've had, I have a few posts on Instagram. I would send them to you so that you can see, see them. Um, Nigerian being in Ghana. Um, so I've been coming to Ghana in and out for a while. Um, but I think in 2013, 14, I started staying in Ghana. Uh, been in, in the music industry, doing events, um, creating music, um, collaborating with people. But from, from, from day one, it, it's, it has, it's, it's an experience that is filled with hostility, love, um, pointing fingers, not good enough you know it's i and i do not the hostility part is the only one i'll be like oh this was not expected um yeah the the part of you're not from here you don't belong here i'm used to that because i got that even in nigeria right but Mm -hmm. the the part where a, a simple conversation could become hostile within seconds just because i am nigerian is something that i've never understood you know and this is also the reason i do not i do not go deep into nigerian communities because every year there's always an attack on nigerians here in ghana um but it's never like something that is largely spoke about if something yeah. very bad happens, they speak about it a little bit and it disappears. So, so when you tell someone who is from here or someone who lives there, like, oh, it's a host situation for Nigerians here, yeah, they're kind of like, oh, are you sure? Um, but also, <laughs> Ghana, Ghana is, is beautiful, you know? I always tell people that the hostility doesn't sum my experience here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've not had the most amazing time in my life here, but I met, I met my partner here. And, yes. and that is the most important thing outside of myself, you know? So yeah. it, Ghana, from, Ghana brings so, so many things to me, brings so many colors. When, when, I, when I needed space to recreate we align, slow down. I came to Ghana, you know. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just so many things, and yeah, that that's that's the way. I can't sum it up to any any particular thing. It's just so. It's a pot of soup. Yeah, but could you give more context? Because you've you've mentioned uh, multiple times that even in Nigeria, you're read in this sort of foreign way. And I, I would love to get more context to that because from oh, my okay. point of view right now, I'm like, if you're Nigerian and you're growing up in Nigeria, what, yeah, what are the nuances yeah. of... Yeah, so I'm, I was born in Benin, Benin City, um, the Benin Kingdom. Um, just being maybe a little bigger than my normal age, uh, more active than my normal age, asked a lot of questions, you know, and people would just be like, who are you? You know, you ask too many questions as a kid. Why? Um, you're too inquisitive, you know? You're not supposed yeah. to be, keep quiet, you know, yeah. listen. And those are things I never believed in. I never believed in the idea of age, um, 
age owning the the being a means to be more informed or more knowledgeable you know so because i never believed in that i only just felt i can act i can seek knowledge you know uh when i started traveling and just um seeing that the world is bigger than your immediate environment and started speaking about my desires you know running spreading so much across you know not seeing the com the complications that people present um to be in nigeria because nigeria you have east south north and when when people enter this conversation it becomes tribalistic it becomes very regional and i never really i never really took part yeah. in all of those conversations and people always felt weird you know in benin i'm isa right so i'm not i'm i'm not born i was born in benin so for, by birth i'm i'm benin but by the the language i'm isa right but when people begin to bring all of these qualifications i just feel like yeah all of those things don't matter to me then move forward the way i carried my hair um so just just it's just piling you know mm. and now i wear I, I love wearing skirts so when i'm in nigeria and i'm wearing a skirt people be like this is not a culture so it's always just something just because you're different always somebody just pointing fingers to tell you why you do not belong and i do not have a problem with that so coming mm. to ghana and saying that that wasn't new you know yeah I hear you. I, I really connect to what you're saying. Like even when you're in the place that you're supposed to be from, yeah. people will find the differences and then yeah. call them out. Yeah. Just like, I don't know, just something about how we group yeah. as humans, I yeah. guess. But you know, just, I, I really will, I'm taking with me when you said earlier that, yeah, just the importance of trusting your body and what your yeah. body's telling you. And that kind of being the, the biggest navigation. Yeah. Yeah. It's something I've been working on. That That's was succinct for me. Yeah, that's that's why for me, my body is my home because it's the only yeah. thing I carry with the most information. Yeah, you know, there's so there's there even information within my body that I do I don't even have access to right now. You know, certain things might trigger them, then they come out. You know, mm -hmm. so the, the body is just a special thing. You know, and yeah, uh, so. This this is yeah. just it. No, yeah, I really I really appreciated your saying it like that. <laughs> but we can talk more more around this, you know, outside of um, this documented conversation. We could just keep talking, yeah. and yeah, because there's a lot of there's a lot there, you know, there's a lot there, and and I feel like we need to speak more. The people people. There are so many conversations around and we need more, you know, yeah. more people to, to, to show that being different doesn't mean you do not come from a place. Yes, I fully agree. Cause I think when people see it and see you just loving yourself, despite differences, that's really effective. And that gives other people it, the confidence to also just like be yeah. themselves in that authentic outside of the bounds way yeah. so yeah as you said we have to just keep sharing yeah so thank you very very much um uh, thank for you <laughs> you go first yeah yeah just gonna say thank you very much for accepting for being a guest um i've loved the conversation i'm having a very good day um it's my anniversary today i i actually didn't plan to take any uh, conversation today, but I remember oh. that we had this. I was like, oh, let's, let's do this. And, and it's just even um, added to the energy um, of the day. So it's beautiful. Yeah, no, go, go celebrate your anniversary. Uh, congratulations. And um, I really appreciated you asking me to do this. And I really appreciated your interview style. Just going to a deep dive of Instagram is like a really good way to do it. It's like uh, made it more, much more personal than I've ever experienced. Really. Yeah, ev ev with everybody, yeah. with everybody um, it's different because I like, to, I like to meet the person, right? It's really not about 
the walk you do no everything we yeah. do comes from who we are you know so yeah. getting to know each person with every conversation yeah yeah, yeah. all right Bye. Great. Bye. Go enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Nice talking. Yeah.